actually, when Ritas mentioned that the go has been landed in Basconia Arena, I literally thought that there was real goat, you know, and I thought that the whole idea is that, okay, they celebrated Dushko's 750th game uh, as Basconia's head coach, and I thought that, you know, as since he's the goat, head coach goat in Basconia, maybe they just delivered some real goat just to show it, you know, to, to, to people. I'm kind of scared that as a you present. buy into the idea that that an animal could be um, landed from the ceiling. It's it's Monday Monday morning. I have a whole kind of crazy ideas in my head, you know. So I understand things uh, like literally. You should have heard what he was talking with Gitz before. All right. Definitely not podcast material. <laughs> I don't think this is uh, either. It's, it's an error. I don't think too. Difficult but topic. Just a warm up again. The boss decides, you know. Yeah. Why did you bring that up, man? What? Um, it's, it's completely unnecessary. Let's celebrate Dushko's celebration, okay? 750 games in Basconia. He's a legend uh, mm-hmm. over there, uh, and I will deliver some numbers. Uh, until that game against Olympiacos, by the, by the way, they won this game. Uh, he reached 483 victories, which is like s- almost 65% of all Basconia games that were played uh, under Dushko. Uh, and... Dushko actually, uh, this this combines all major competitions like Copa del Rey, ACB, EuroLeague, and probably some other competition that I don't remember right now. Maybe Super Cup. Uh, so four chapters of Dushko in Basconia. His journey started in Basconia in in two thousands. He actually won the first ACB title for for Basconia in the club's history. A lot of a lot of good memories. A lot of stuff. So it was nice to see him celebrating and the club, you know, uh, kind of marking this interesting stage, chapter, mark of his career. I barely remember anybody else, actually, from head coaches uh, coaching their team, like, for as many as 750 games, right? Maybe Pablo Lasso Pablo should be for one team. there, but still, <clears throat> I mean, that's a lot. That is a lot, especially when you know that it's 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 not like he's been the head coach for 15 consecutive years or anything like that. He had separate stints with the same club, which uh, adds up to 750 games already. It it is pretty impressive, you know. I think his longest stint with with Basconia or Tau Keramica, well, in general, in Vittoria, was like uh, three consecutive seasons? No, five. Five? From 2000 to 2005. And then he... Join Barcelona, right? Yeah, and then he returned for four years. Yeah. And then there was this in and out moment before COVID and after COVID. And, you know, mm. right now. So, wow. so how many different stints? Four. The, it, four. This is the fourth stint. Mm. I just found an article where uh, uh, it says not about him, but just about this, some statistics. How many coaches have, how many games uh, they have they coached in the EuroLeague? And Ergen Ataman just uh, more, a little bit more than one month ago, become on, became only the third coach to coach 400 games in the EuroLeague. Uh, obviously, Jelko has the, the, the most games coached in the EuroLeague. Um, I think uh, it was five, 504. Ettore Messina was 450, ranked second. Dushko is fourth. And uh, followed by they are followed by Xavi Pascual and Pablo Lasso, but this is only about Euroleague games. So, and I think it's probably the modern <laughs> Euroleague, right? I think so. So for yeah. Ettore Messina, those yeah, yeah those games in FIBA Euroleague don't count. Yeah, th- since uh, 2000 and 2001 okay. season. So in the modern Euroleague for the last 20, yeah. 24 years, Dusko is fourth. So let's celebrate Dusko. I have some late gifts for you. It's oh, not finally. Christmas gifts. It's not Christmas gifts, but some special gifts from dushkista.com. It already arrived. Which which color do you prefer, guys? What blue do you have? Or red one? I take blue. You take blue? This is the new style of dushkista.com brand and the hat collection that they have. <laughs> I'll give you this one, red Thanks. one. And this is my wow. personal favorite that I have. I mean, do we have to do the podcast with this? We're, sure, we're, sure. We're talking about uh, not too many coaches have 750 games for one club. Not too many coaches have their own brand. I, I think he's I, the only one. I think one. he's the yeah. only one, right? And this is the brand ran by 
uh, his daughter, Dea nice. Ivanovic. And this is such a random story. I was watching Barcelona Basconia game in Barca. Uh, I went there for a double round week to cover El Clasico as well. This is the end of the halftime, and um, there is some lady coming from so. the VAP tribune, and media seats are just above the VAP tribune. And I didn't expect that interaction. She's just coming, and I, I started following her, you know, where is she going? And, you know, suddenly she approaches me, and there's a lot of noise. And the only thing that I hear is Ivanovic, or something like daughter of Ivanovic. So she introduced me to, to, to me. Um, and she said that, oh, uh, since you talk a lot about my dad and the podcast, I decided you, yeah, it is a showing. Can, can you can you read? Never give up. Always believe. Enjoy suffering. <laughs> this is the three major columns of Dushko's mantra, which is like official and real thing. And of course, the other one we have, tiredness does not exist. I mean, that's crazy. And what do you have on your? I just have oh, you have the hair uh, okay. silhouette. Yeah, I mean, just I saw it the first time I saw it. It was when he was the head coach of Zvezda, and I was like, I had to get this hat. So a few months later, his daughter approaches me and she says that since you talk a lot about my dad and the podcast, and you know, when I heard those words, I was like, oh my god, she's going to be offended because we made some jokes, although we we really. Uh, speak a lot about his dad but I also we spoke a lot you know from the good uh, from the good side you know we kind of defended him when Zvezda decided to uh, part ways with him you know we also appreciated good things he did in Zvezda and, and previous stints with Basconia but also we made some fun of his off-season culture and stuff like that so I'm like and it was coming straight after I had some internal conflict with Basconia they didn't let me to do um, video with Chima Monek and Tadej Sedekerskis which we agreed with players but the club decided to uh, not allow me to to do it and you know I see you know Dushko's daughter is coming and I'm like oh my god she's also going to go at me but suddenly she says that you since you speak a lot about my dad I I want to give you some merch you know I'm like, okay, I love I love your hats. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan. I didn't know that you actually run this dushkista.com brand and this it's it, this whole account. So we agreed on sending those three cool hats. And I said that I'm, for sure we're going to wear it during the podcast and do some promo. So Ritis yeah. is wearing it proudly. Man, that's amazing I, merch, to be honest. <clears throat> I look really bad in, in hats usually. Not that I look good without a hat, but... I know. I mean, I I like it. It's Man. nice. It's really cool. It's Thank really you. cool. So, dushkista.com, they had all kinds of merchandise, actually, not only hats. They have some cool t-shirt. Uh, personally, I would prefer this one. This is a green with black silhouette. They have a chef apron. Yeah, they have a chef apron. They have <laughs> hoodies. Look at those hoodies. White, red. Wow. Maybe it was... It takes cooking to whole another level, like... Yeah, <laughs> cooking with Dushko, man. That's that's some amazing stuff that you can find on Dushkista.com. The whole Dushkista idea uh, is coming from his latest ACB title uh, with Basconia. Um, I talked uh, today, and she said that uh, how how this brand was created, how this how this Dushkista stuff. Uh, was born. So she said that when they won the ACB title in 2020, a bunch of newspapers published articles with Dushkonia and Dushkista. So it felt right to keep it like that. Dushkonia. That's that's some amazing stuff. I actually got some So nice we are message fr from. from now on we are calling it Dushkonia, right? It's not Basconia anymore. I have Stankonia <laughs> shirt and and Dushko Dushkonia hat. Like, <laughs> pretty cool. Yeah, dear Donatas, I hope you like our hats as as much as we do and wear them with pride. All the best, Dea Ivanovic. I'm wearing with with all the pride for sure. That's some cool stuff. <laughs> I, that's a crazy that's a great story. And man, I like those brands. I like those very niche brands, I would say. You cannot you won't find a lot of good stuff um, um, related to European basketball merchandise. Even mm. clubs, they don't a lot of clubs don't have Good merch, I would say. Yeah, and the uh, there's a big problem in Europe. And the Euroleague store on Amazon is dead. Oh my god, it I hasn't been updated. Where, I don't even know where to buy. Like, if I want a, a shirt for, for for from a Euroleague player, I don't even know where to go to buy it. Usually directly to the club, but yeah. 
uh, not all clubs not all basically clubs. send to to your country for example some of them have a fan shop uh, i remember when i went to uh, alba berlin fan shop in berlin during the eurobasket it was like somewhere uh, far away from 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 the arena and when I entered the room, I thought like I'm in, in, in a clinic or somewhere. It, it didn't feel like a fan shop. And then they told me, go to the third floor. I went there. There's nobody. There's just a, a lot of stuff. Eventually, a lady <laughs> she was surprised entered the room and she probably was a bit surprised. And I said, I'm, I'm interested in this hoodie. Um, I don't think they even had like uh, game jerseys. But they did have some merch. So I think clubs don't really emphasize the merchandise as much because uh, the locals have it. They can buy it. And probably most of the clubs don't feel they are um, interesting internationally. And like mm. that uh, it, mm -hmm. <clears throat> there is a need or and demand for them to, let's say, sell their merch and, and send to, to other continents and other countries. But this Dushkista thing is, is, is really nice. I think maybe, who knows, uh, it, it could influence some other coaches or players to start their own brand and, and, and start their own line. Um, of course, Dushko is iconic, the ponytail. My, yeah. my father actually has a ponytail, so if I put this hat on him, he could, <laughs> could look like Dushko. <laughs> we will be waiting for that picture. <laughs> and by the way, regarding the international shipping, uh, this whole package of hats was sent to me a week ago on Saturday. And actually, I got it as soon as by Friday, it was already sent to my home. So that's crazy. That's a super fast delivery. And again, Dushkista.com, they have some crazy stuff like Dushkista hat, jeans style. They have some nice pink hat as well. Uh, they also have some winter uh, stuff for winter. So amazing amazing merch and it's so simple to to get fast delivery so i mean it doesn't matter if you're a basconia fan or not uh, it doesn't matter if you're a zvezda fan or not because dushko was in zvezda as well but i think for every basketball geek uh, basketball fan in europe who loves euroleague that's that's a must that's a must uh, to have so dushkista.com you will find lots of good stuff uh, over there and i'm just excited again that we have some euroleague brands niche brands just existing and you know they've so such an original idea so that's cool shout out to De Ivanovic and this whole brand and uh, again to celebrate Dushko I think uh, I, I I kind of came up with this idea to to bring this topic uh, speaking of some clubs and head coaches we Dushko is is a clear association of Basconia when you think about Basconia uh you f start thinking about icons that were there and dushko is one of the first names that probably comes to your mind is that better <laughs> oh, you're like uh is that better how to say it <laughs> just say it you look interesting you look interesting yeah. probably that's maybe better. it's this this one this fits you better right. yeah I mean. uh Oh, Donatas was so serious and i was just looking at Ritz and waiting for <laughs> Donatas to see his reaction <laughs> There was some street style, right? Uh, That's go. what I am. I I go by street style. It's just that wearing hats is, is how not is usually Alba my thing. How is Alba hoodie in the last podcast street style? Any hoodie is street style if it's oversized. Okay. <laughs> so we have 18 year league teams. This I will is go, not going to be a serious podcast. I will guy. go through the... That's true because we're going to discuss Mike Brown's... Mm, Mm. Uh, laptop conference and Carmelo Anthony and Jokic controversy and a lot of a lot of difference. <laughs> We're gonna put it on the podcast. Can as you well. can you show it here, Mantos? <laughs> Later. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's be more serious. 18 year league teams. I'll I'll go through every. Uh, I'll go through each of them and let me know the first association of the head coach that comes to your mind when I mention this name and maybe that's going to be the game for our viewers as well so I will go uh, from the start of the current standings that we have so Real Madrid Pablo Lasso too, easy too, one too easy right yeah. Yeah. Pablo Bojdar Malkovic <laughs> Barcelona is interesting Xavi Pascal to me probably Xavi yeah 
Peshish had a big stint over there, mm-hmm. big chapter. But the first guy who comes to me, I mean, it also comes to the fact that, you know, we also relate this memory to ourselves. And we start, we followed basketball more like 13 years ago, not 23 years ago when Peshish yeah. won the EuroLeague. So to me also, Xavi Pascal is the first one who comes to my mind. And he's also all the time linked with being yeah. going back to Barcelona. So it's like in your head, it's always... Barca, Xavi, Barca, He's also the last head coach who won the EuroLeague with Barca. So, so that's why. Virtus Bologna. Um, Ettore Messina. Ettore Messina, yeah. 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 And you? I don't know. Scariolo. Scariolo, wow. That's interesting. For me, it's going to be a lot of... It's recency bias, basically. Uh-huh. The, the, the coaches that have been there in the last 10 years for more than a couple of years probably is going to be uh, the, the, the guys for me. Like, I have... But, you yeah. know, to me, still, I have those memories of uh, Virtus Bologna or Kinder, Kinder Bologna playing a EuroLeague final series versus uh, Tau Keramica, which was which was a thing in 2001. And I have the memories from Munich. Uh, Žalgir is playing the final versus uh, Kinder Bologna as well. Uh, so Messina was was their coach. I, mean, I know it's, it was mainly before the modern day EuroLeague, but I still have some memories as a kid and. I associate this club with Ettore Messina a lot. He won the EuroLeague with them two times in 1998 and 2001. So I think it's a pretty good association. Although I agree with the recency bias thing. Like sometimes it's it's easier to just pick someone who has been the coach recently. Uh, you associate with yeah, yeah, yeah. With those, that, that is those guys in your that head. Is true. Panath Naikos, too easy. How many coaches, how, in, for how many teams we will mention Jelko Bradovic? That's, okay, that's where I'm interested in. Let's check. So Panath Naikos, okay. we all agree, Jelko Bradovic. That's funny that Although, because... Although, uh, okay. I do have Rick some... Pitino. some, some uh, <laughs> Recent bias. When somebody says Panath Naikos, I always think that Pedulakis will take ah, over in, in okay. November. Okay. <laughs> that, I thought that you're going to bring up... Uh, so Rick Pitino is not coming through that door, right? Nope. Okay. Not today. <laughs> Fenerbahce. Jelko Bradovic. Mm, probably. Probably. I have some memories stuck in my head about Bogdan Tanjevic. Okay. So I'm going to... Nevin Spahia, but I mean... No, I think comp- just... for some reason I, I okay. associate the club with Bogdan Tanjevic. Tanjevic is a legend. Uh, Makab is an interesting... I just remember when he lost... He, he always had a mint... Uh, or a gu- or gum uh, during the game, and, and I remember one time when he just opened his mouth <laughs> and he just dropped them in. Okay, back in the day he was like smoking all the time. I think most of the these guys were smoking. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But it was like almost on the court, you know. Okay. It was to, on, to such an extent. That's something that I would expect from an Italian football coach in early nineties yeah. or eighties. Yeah, or recent or you know twenty twenty four. Maccabi. Piniger Sean, uh, Piniger Sean, yeah. I sure. Three Although titles. A lot may say that, many may say that David Blatt is the first one who comes to their David mind. David Blatt maybe, the maybe and you know, had they, more influence on the club in general, like not mm. only as a coach, uh, as an advisor, a, as someone who basically uh, created some sort of, I don't know, Maccabi culture, you could say. And even when Pini Gershon was winning those yearly titles as the head coach, David Blatt was the assistant coach. Yeah. And I remember reading Shara's book where he mentioned that, you know, Blatt was behind Maccabi's game plan. Pini was the, the guy who handled and managed the team on the court. Yeah. So Blatt was a I big part of those victories as well. Both should be mentioned on, on the same page. Olympiakos. This one was hard, but I would, say, I, I would still say Bartzokas because he, this stint, he had a previous stint, mm. and I don't know, nobody has been there for longer in the recent uh, past I'm than, than Bartzokas. And their play style is so unique because of him. Mm-hmm. So to me, it's he's one of the most unique coaches, I think, in the EuroLeague. So that's why I associate Olympia Kos with Bartzokas. These are fair points, but I'm going to go with... Uh, Dusan Ivkovic. Okay. I think he he brought back the glory to Olympiakos. And the coaches that followed him uh, were also successful. But at the time, Olympiakos were huge underdogs. Yeah. Nobody probably even predicted them to be in the Final Four. Not, not to say that to win the Final Four. So 
and he did it and and he's a legendary coach with so much experience he's respected he will always be remembered so um I do associate him with Olympiakos and I do have some associations also with uh Panayotis Yanakis and Jonas Kozlowskis yeah. hmm. so there are some solid Great coaches choices. to choose from uh Monaco very uh, young team very new club and Sasha Bradovic has done good things so far with them and it's between him and and Zvezdan Mitrovic probably, probably yeah. yeah and Sasha actually fits their style I don't know I mean at the time when they signed him it seemed to me like it might go wrong because they had a lot of egos a lot of players that demand the ball and it I, I was thinking like is he the right coach for Dwayne Bacon Mike James and all these other guys but that was instant success. Turned so, out to be the perfect coach. So, yeah. Do you have? Do you agree with all these names? Or, or? so far, yeah. No. I mean, okay. most of these were easy. I mean, I just disagreed with Maccabi maybe mm. bringing in Blatt, but okay, most of these guys were like kind of good choices. I, 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 the the hardest team for for me was here Valencia probably. Okay, we'll we'll go with soon, Valencia as well yeah, soon, sure. but let's go with Partizan right now because that's where you know. You can bring Jelko Bradovic, and this is a legit choice, but I have those memories of Dusko Jošević Partizan, you know, having those young kids playing for Partizan, two free imports that made a huge impact and made it to the final to four. The final four. Boma Kaleb, Whoa. Lawrence Roberts, yeah. a lot of young young players Alex in that Maric. team. Alex Maric was, was uh, killing. So Dusan Ketchman was, was the captain of the team. Yeah, Rasic was Rasic. Uh, Yeah, I... I actually agree with Dushko Vujovic. I have a memory of him taking a phone call like three minutes before the tip off. Okay. That was a game in where was uh, that? In in Vilnius, I think. Okay. Maybe. Uh, but I might be wrong about the uh, the the place, ah, the okay. venue. But I do remember watching the game on television and camera is showing him and it's like two or three minutes before the tip off and he's taking a phone call on that um old nokia phone mm. <laughs> probably that was important yeah maybe it was something personal you know, i mean you we know. see coaches uh, taking phone calls during press conferences but rarely do you see a coach taking a phone call uh minutes, some teams minutes before the some tip-off. teams use uh, cell phones during the timeouts yeah but for different purposes like they yeah. don't call their wives yeah i think I have an interesting choice here, guys. In yeah, season? go for it. Yeah, Nena Chanak. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Shout out to <laughs> Nena Chanak in Panevijis, but uh, I still go with Jelko. Uh, Basconia, all clear. Yeah. Dushkonia, um, Valencia. I, I actually have hard. no association with this club, to be honest, from the head coach but, hmm. department. It's so many, like... Good choices, actually. But even Pablo Lasso was there. But yeah, uh, who Pedro was that? Pedro who, Martinez sponsor yeah, now. I'm thinking, ah, I'm thinking about Pedro Martinez. Martinez. Legit. He was uh, coaching the team when they beat Real Madrid in the series, the, and they won the ACB. Yeah, and it was already decided that he's gonna leave after the season. So it was a weird. Just, just, just look at the listen to timing. the names that have coached them I, in the last twenty years. Lasso. Uh, Katsikaris, Nevens Bahia, Pesic, Perasovic, mm. uh, Martinez, Vidoreta, Ponsornao, Peñaroya, now Mumbru. I think Pedro Martinez stands out from that list. Been there for two seasons. I know he, he coached other uh, Spanish teams and he, he, he changes teams. but and, and I don't necessarily associate him with Valencia that much. Mm. But that season with him was a uh, huge success. And, and you know, but Valencia, first of all, gives me associations uh, with their colors, their yeah. gym. Uh, and EuroCup, for some reason. EuroCup. Euro Cup. We all remember them from, the, uh, from Rita's times. Yeah. When they brought yeah. those great players to the team. Oh, at the time, they had Rakosh, Argentinians, Roberto. Uh, Olympic champions on, on, on the roster, like uh, uh, Montecchio, uh, Alberto. But the first association is probably with players with Bojan Dublevic, with Van Rossum, uh, because they are a team with a lot of continuity. They used to have the core of the team for five or six years. Valencia, to me, 
reminds that 2005 Euro Cup semi-final in Vilnius. Yeah. In Siemens Arena. Full I thought, gym, I thought the, the loudest had no chance. that gym have, Nesby, right? has ever been. Yeah, that's Robert the, Stelmacher's. The best that that Siemens Arena was ever. Wow. Right, true. And and I, I didn't think actually Ritas could beat that Valencia team because I looked at the names and I thought like there are so many legendary players, superstars that belong in the EuroLeague, not in the ULEP Cup. But somehow Ritas did it. Rakocevic, Oberto, Rigodo, Rigodo, Montecchio. But right. yeah, Pedro Martinez is a good choice. He actually, Dejan Tomasevic. Oh, he actually reached thousand games coached in in, in the ACB this weekend. Mm. Uh, he's now coaching Mandresa, and he became only the second coach to reach that mark in the history of the ACB. So shout out to Pedro, amazing coach actually. I'm I'm still surprised why he he didn't get more chances in the Euroleague because tactically he's he's just amazing. Maybe he didn't re want to go abroad. I heard that uh, recently he had those thoughts about moving abroad. Uh, but at the same time, I also heard that he really appreciates what he's getting in Madresa, the power, yeah. the control of the club. So he's just being where he feels most respected, most beloved, and where he can kind of think of some kind of continuity. Milan, that's an interesting one. This was near Valencia in terms of understanding which one Pesha, is it. Simone Penigiani, but Penigiani is more of a Montepaschi guy. But, you know, most of the coaches in Milan uh, basically failed to deliver. Yeah. So you don't associate exactly. the club with coaches that didn't win titles, didn't get to the EuroLeague playoffs. Um, okay, Milan, uh, one time they they had a nice team with guys like Curtis Gerald, Skeet Langford, and they were like one win away from the Final Four. They lost to Maccabi. But I, I still have to say Messina because, like... Not only you associate him with the club, mm -hmm. he basically is the, he club. is the club. He runs the club, so and he changed the culture. He of course, he did. Like made uh, Milan competitive. Well, the very first thing he did once he signed with Milan is he is he sent a clear message that he doesn't want Mike James on the team, and then he had two weeks of of great um, Twitter comments about how Mike is still under contract and he's going to show up in Mediolanum drinking beer and watching games if he's not playing. <laughs> that was that was uh, pretty funny at the time. But he sorted out uh, quite quite uh, quickly, although like that was the first statement. Like, I'm here, now mm -hmm. I'm the coach, now I run things. And he he's doing things his own way until, until today. And you can see that he has... Uh, an absolute trust from Giorgio Armani and everybody else in Milan, and, and he's continuing. I think uh, if people from Italy are listening, they will say Dan Peterson. Oh yeah, that's, the name. That's it's like they're associating him. Obviously, I wasn't born when he was Olympia's coach, but the, from the number of times I heard his mm -hmm. name when I was in, when I was living in Italy, is just I think he he's the guy to associate Milan with. He has been their coach for eight years. Then he came back for six months in 2011 before he was succeeded by Scariolo. And, you know, he has the nickname, the coach in, in Italy. So I think like he is the guy yeah, that's, to associate with, with Milano. Yeah. Because he has won also yeah, I think EuroLeague and stuff. In 90s, right? Mm -hmm. Or 80s? 1987. Mm -hmm. I think people who uh, were into basketball uh, in, in, in 90s and because we were just kids starting to watch basketball and, and falling in love with that sport. Those who watched in, in the 90s will admit that uh, the Italian teams were the powerhouse teams at, at the time, and probably mm. Italian league was the best that we're, we're talking about, the ACB league right now, being the most competitive and uh, having uh, the best quality. And I think in the 80s and in the 90s, it was Italy. Mm. True, true. They were producing most talents with teams like Benetton. Benetton, Treviso, uh, Virtus, uh, Puff, Bologna, Fortitudo, yeah. they, they call it probably Milan, uh, Scavolini, Pesaro. I mean, so many uh, great teams. Yeah, Mike D'Antoni also worked for Milan for four years. Yep. Although I, I and just... played. I, yeah, he actually retired in Milan, I think, and then he continued as the head coach. I actually listened to Mauricio Gerardini's podcast yesterday, 
on Ben's podcast uh, channel. Very good conversation, by the way. And he mentioned those stories, like when he went to Mike D'Antoni went to Treviso, he was still an unproven coach. You know, there were a lot of questions if he's going to be a successful one, and somehow they managed uh, to become a successful uh, team. So Benetton had some great years, Mike D'Antoni too, and he went for the NBA. Uh, Zvezda, Dan Radonjic, maybe. Hmm. Who else, if not him? No, they changed I'm, so many coaches. I'm, I'm thinking. Not many actually stayed there for more than two seasons. I think more Shakota, than one, maybe. Maybe maybe Shakota and somebody else. Let's, Let's see. Who, oh my God, how many coaches they have changed? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Wow. So maybe this list is maybe Dan Radonich is else. the right choice. Dan Radonich been there for from 2013 to 2017 and then from 2020 to 2022 he's like the only guy that's been there for more than one season in the last in the Ten last years? i'm still going through the list but dragan shakota from 2005 to 2007 is one of the last coaches to be there for more than one season to be honest that's wow. what we call the hot seat yeah for head coaches I so Radonjic it is. Yeah, Radonjic it is for sure because <laughs> yeah. he's the only guy that has been there in the last 19 years for no sorry seven in the last 17 years for more than uh one season. That's crazy. That's yep. a crazy stat for you. Yep. Uh Bayern Munich another young Euroleague club. So far I mean Trinkieri left the biggest mark with that team in the Euroleague getting to the playoffs twice. Uh, making it a five-game series versus Milan and versus Barcelona. I agree. I'll go with Trinkier as well. FS is the well home of Ergin Ataman, right? For yeah. sure. No doubt. Easy. Jalgris. Charas. Um, Charas. Re- recency bias again says Charas. Jonas Kozlowskis won the EuroLeague with the team in He's 1999. The second name that I come uh, up with. But then I somehow uh, have some nostalgia about those good old days with Sireka and Krapikas coaching, coaching the team, <laughs> oh, not being able to actually communicate with their American players, but Ed Cotta and Anton Ockerberg doing their own thing. I mean, Krapikas was doing like, the communication thing, you know? I I guess. <laughs> but know, I mean, had, yeah. uh, a lot of foreigner experience yeah, in Germany. Those were the days. <laughs> those yeah, were the those days. Those were interesting days. But obviously, Shadas in, in in today's Euro League, he's the one who basically brought back hope uh, to Konas, and uh, that sold out culture in Jalgiris Arena became a thing during mm-hmm. the Shadas days. Before they were playing in that arena since 2011. Yeah, but having a sold out crowd was was not really a thing. Okay, people were supporting Jalgiris, but not the way they are right now. Hmm. And it has a lot to do with Sharas um, winning, overachieving, getting to the final four, uh, making... Suffering also, uh, enjoying Enjoying suffering, suffering making the playoffs uh, normality for Jalgiris, although it's something uh, uh, unusual and, and not what you should expect from a, a low-budget team in EuroLeague. And I remember that during Sharas' days, after the game ended, a lot of people still stayed in their arena and on the video cube they would show the press conference. Yeah. Fifteen or twenty minutes after the game has finished, yes. actually. Yes. They people, would it... people are still still there drinking, uh, eating snacks because they know the game's finished, but they still want to hear what the mm. coach has to say. I don't think that happens anywhere else. Mm-hmm. I remember there would have there would be like three, four thousand people, especially after uh, that playoff win against Olympia Kos, uh, like at least half of the gym stayed to watch that press conference. Yeah. 20, 25 minutes after the game. And to me, he he's also the guy I associate Jagras with because just simply he changed the culture. That's it. That that's that, that switch is, is is too huge to to ignore. Yeah, Jalgarin is known for some late stays, late stays, especially wow. following Olympiakos game. At the same time, when there was this world hockey championship, <laughs> so they changed ice straight after the game. Yeah. They changed the basketball floor with ice and players and 
coaches and everybody else they stayed and celebrated. Are they doing the it morning. right now? Because they also had ice last week. I don't know. Who knows? I didn't check it. Uh, Alba Berlin is a tough one. Oof. Uh, Actually, I think that those, uh, let's say, more experienced basketball fans, they might associate with the club of Svetislav Pesic. Yeah, one is Svetislav Pesic. But uh, that was a different Alba Berlin. Uh, the way Alba Berlin plays, uh, their style of basketball right now is basically created by Aita. Hmm. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to say Aita Garcia Renesas. Israel Gonzalez is, is like... Uh, Six, his he's, like his, he's like his pupil, like he, Ito Garcia Renesas taught him, yeah. have prepared him for the job, and now he's coaching the team. So Sasha Bradovic has been there for four years, too. Yep. Yeah, but the best chapter in their history was actually uh, with Svetislav Pesic, numerous of German league titles, uh, German Cup. So, yeah. But they had a Courage Cup as uh, well. Bundesliga repeat just, just recently. Yeah, yeah. True. And as well, Villarban. That is a tough one. Like yeah. Tony Parker. <laughs> Tony Parker. <laughs> uh, Adige, it's got to yeah. be his brother. TJ Parker. I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's a club with a lot of history, so you should probably go deeper uh, to find out who's the most successful coach, but I don't necessarily associate them with, with someone. They had Gregor Bugnot coaching the team for nine years in in nineties. Other than that, there weren't some long stints. JD Jackson. I see Claude Bergeau. I think he was for a former French national team coach. Also. Yeah. So, yeah. I never. Some clubbed. of these coaches don't even have Wikipedia pages. True. True. So yeah, that's that's it. That's the end of the list. Let's talk about basketball right now. Um, Basconi actually they won against Olympiakos uh, on Friday, and they're ten and six under Dushko. But I have a question about Olympiakos. We all, I think, we all saw them as a kind of our potential locks for the final four before the season. Mm-hmm. But uh, did we playoff locks? Maybe. Not I think we were like listing Real Madrid mm. for sure. We should rewatch, rewind those podcasts. Well, but me, I think that we listed Olympiacos now. Keep talking, for, keep talking. I mean, I, having, I, will, I will find our power. Ha- having someone as a lock is is a different conversation than just predicting someone to to be. Okay, in the maybe final four. we predicted them to be in the final. Maybe four. I don't remember. Your league yes. power rankings. But I remember second. I did GM survey and a lot of. Predictions were saying that Olympiacos will face Real Madrid. So let's say a lot of people had high expectations on them. And my question is, from one, one to five, how much you're concerned about Olympiacos' long-term chances this season? Um, I'm going to say two. I'm not too concerned. I think it's just about getting to the playoffs. And then who knows who you're going to face. Like... Of course, you don't want to play Madrid in 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 the series. Every, every other team they can they can beat in the best of five. Um, okay, recently when they get to the final four, uh, two years in a row, they had a home court advantage, which is kind of important when you play the game five. Um, I'm not sure about the home court advantage right now, but I I I still have a lot of confidence that they will be in the playoffs. Final four, uh, that's going to be tough. You had actually the most uh, doubt uh, about Olympia cause before the season because I found our power rankings from October 2nd. Uh, yeah. You had them in sixth, Ritas. Yeah. You had them, uh, you had Olympia cause at fourth and I had them at third. Oh, okay. And that's... sixth makes a lot of sense right now. <laughs> yeah. Because they're actually seventh right now. Yeah, and one mix win... of playing teams with one... Monaco, Partizan, and Basconia. One win behind Maccabi, two wins behind Fenerbahce and Panathinaikos. I think the thing with Olympiakos is it, it it's super important for them to get home court advantage in the playoffs. Uh, I don't think any of those teams from the second spot, low and lower, are better than some other teams. Like there isn't a huge gap between those teams. It's like there yeah. is Real Madrid, 
and then there are all the other teams. But to me, the question is the same as it was last year. It, it's their fourth quarter. And uh, looking just purely at stats first, yeah. is uh, their offense gets way worse in the fourth quarter by eight points in 100 possessions. And it's the fourth worst offense in the fourth quarter only. Uh, if you're taking the first three quarters, they have the eighth best, so they are kind of average. But if you take only the fourth quarter, they are 15th, and that that's what concerns me. And they have lost Slukas, Vizenkov, and they're still finding ways how to score in the offense in the fourth quarter. And I know that Olympiacos fans will say, oh, but we're this is not how we play offense. We are a team basketball team, we make passes, we, but... I see Olympiacos playing uh, post-ups for Mustafa Fall as their number one, let's say, uh, offense in the fourth quarter. This is where they find the, the biggest advantage in, in the fourth quarter. And it is not easy to play this way because, first of all, you have to pass the ball to him. And Olympiacos made three turnovers against Basconia in the fourth quarter only by trying to pass the ball to him inside. They were forcing the game too much in the post, I think. It's not that easy as just simply having an offensive player in the perimeter, just, you know, taking the ball from all the way to the other side, just playing pick and roll, play, playing one-on-one, -on -one. like Marcus Howard showed them a perfect example. Just uh, uh, eight points, I think, in the, in the fourth quarter, simply by playing one-on-one. -on -one. Beats his man, sees the help inside, makes a floater. And then two free pointers, one in the ISO situation, pull back free, then the the step back in the pick and roll. He doesn't need anything extra. Like in the fourth quarter, modern basketball, it is you have to have perimeter guys that are scoring, and he, that type of player that Marcus Howard is, I think, would make Olympia cost to me uh, would make me say that Olympia cost are definitely going to make the final four mm. because they have the defense, they have the beautiful offense. Um, it is interesting to watch. They have the passing. They are not selfish. But it's just in the fourth quarter when they need to score. If they are not winning by 10 uh, or more before the fourth quarter, I have doubts about them every time. Mm. And it's and it shows, you know, during games and it also shows in in the stats. I think it's a pretty solid analysis. Um I have to say that people are probably still uh questioning their in-season additions. Uh Prasdekis, Mitru Long, Petrushev, okay, you have the big guys already, so for Petrushev, it's, it's kind of, you have to be patient. You will get your opportunities. Maybe someone gets injured. Uh, we saw that Barzokas uh, plays him as a four, uh, but sometimes he's he's like the 12th man on the roster. So maybe people are still questioning those in-season additions. Um, although, like Mitru Long and, and Petrushev make sense to me, I'm still not sure why they ha had to pay half a million euros for Brasdekis. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, man. I can't figure this one out. Um, I don't know. Maybe they're looking at him playing. as the long-term project because if you look back to their history, there are a lot of players who were not playing a lot mm. in their first seasons, but then they developed and became, you know, uh, corner store players. But, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking from the, uh, from the perspective of uh, you clearly need a guard. You clearly need someone who can... Uh, play from the perimeter, create his own shot. And then you're buying a player where you already have Papa Nicolau, uh, Shaq Makisic. Uh, we're talking about those um, bigger bodies, let's say, uh, small forward shooting guards. And I I don't know why they needed Brasdekis, honestly. Yeah. Because cause, cause uh, if he was a Greek player, then okay. I can see some sense. But he's a foreign player. You paid money for and him. I, 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 he, they, sorry, they brought him in basically, I think, to be that guy. You know, he can score one on one, but he's a guy that needs confidence to do that in the fourth quarter. And uh, he's not been given playing time to uh, develop, you know, uh, some confidence. And, and that's mm. why I don't understand it. Like, I understand why they tried to sign him because he kind of, uh, you know, covers the needs of your team that you needed in the summer. But at the same time, he's a different type of player than, you know, he needs playing time. He needs to play 25 minutes per game. He yeah. needs to have the ball in his hands. He can't play five minutes in through three quarters 
Then you put him in in the fourth quarter, and he's like, he has now no rhythm I'm going to score. And he has no rhythm. He has but no confidence from the head coach Barsocas. I remember this game in Barca last week. Uh, he entered uh, Brazegas entered the court just at the end of the second quarter, and he started with some mistake. But I would say it was not, you know, it was kind of accidental mistake. And the first reaction of Barsocas was like, oh my god, oh my god, you know, he he was mad. But the guy finishes the quarter with five points. He gives some 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 fresh things for their offense and in the second half when Olympiago started uh, struggling offensively Barsocas didn't uh, sub in Brazekis anymore and he didn't play in the second half so I just sometimes I don't get it because you know when they were lacking something offensively and Brazekis showed some good glimpses in the end of the second quarter he didn't get an, any opportunity in the second half so I just want to elaborate on your thought about uh, perimeter players deciding the fourth quarter like uh would I prefer Brasdekis as my decider? Uh, probably not, because the examples that you 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 gave Marcus Howard, he can shoot off the dribble, a good three point shooter. Uh, Shane Larkin, Mike James, all these guards, they can create their own shot, and they're a three point threat. Brasdekis is sort of a guy that other teams could live with him shooting threes off the dribble. Um, He's he's a slasher. He he he's a mm. cutter. He wants to go to the paint. He wants to play physical basketball. That's not necessarily what I prefer. But, talking about players who close the fourth yeah. quarter. Although he had some good moments in the Lithuanian national team. I'm not team saying he didn't. I I, and and I'm contract. not saying he's a bad yeah. player. I'm just saying that if Olympiakos needs someone to close the games to take over the yeah. fourth quarter. I don't think Brasdakis is the guy. I would prefer a, a guard, a solid ball handler, who can shoot the free, who can make some tough shots to to, mm. to, to be the man. To, in a perfect world, yeah. in a perfect scenario, he is the second guy on your team. Yeah. In my eyes. And you still need someone who is making long shots. Because we had a, a sit down with Mike, Mike James, and, and we, 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 we asked him, how do you what do you prefer in late games? And, and he said, I'm going for a step back. I'm going for a jump shot because they're not calling you a foul exactly. in the last possession. And that's why I think, you know, you mentioned this. Brasdakis is a perfect second guy on your team, but but you need a, someone who can make a jump shot. Yep. It, it is basic as that. You need someone who can make a jump shot to win the games in the end. And it's not that your beautiful system that you're playing in in the in Piraeus is going to help you every time in every fourth quarter. It is super hard to win just playing by team basketball on mm. this level. But still, the question that was raised was, how worried are you about Olympiacos from one to five? I said two. I would what say more say? because I think uh, I think of them. You know, Olympiacos were in the final last year. So their goal is to win, I think, this year. Their fans might, we think, might think it, but, you know, when you think about them, they lost Vezenkov and they lost Luka. So it's okay, hard to even, you know, raise your expectations to win something when you lose two superstars. Okay, maybe that was an expectation from their hardcore fans before the season. Right now, maybe they're thinking getting to the final four is a I think they're good objective. thinking right? just about the playoffs, to be honest. Just about the I mean, playoffs if you're for a team like Olympia Cause? I mean, step by step, really. I don't think so. When you that, see that's the challenges that they're having. Making playoffs, uh, probably someone out of nine spot will make the playoffs. Start I, arguing. I, <laughs> no, but like, no. I think Olympia Unleash Cause, your inner Stephen A. Come on. Come on now. Like, Olympia Cause will ha has to think about getting to the final four, not only the playoffs. Yeah, that's true. But you have to think about it step by step. So the playoffs, Say the right louder. matchups, oh, no. and you're, you're getting there. Say it louder. Come on, man. You cannot go that far, actually, after you lose two superstar players. So No, I think, I think they're going to... Especially when you see those issues and challenges that you're going through during the season. The transition is not easy. I know. We may, may thought that the transition could be easier, but it's not. It's it's tough. And um, we're talking not just about two guys that they were missing, but they were missing Shaq McKissick for the long stretch of the season. And if we are talking about the four quarters, last season he was their ta second uh, best uh, scorer in the four quarters, averaging almost five points per uh, four quarter, uh, just behind Slukas. They were actually scoring the same amount of points, 4.5, both Slukas and McKissick last year. We don't have Lerenzakis Magic anymore this year. He was the third best scorer on their team in the four quarters. Well, let's so. be honest, Lorenzakis magic didn't seem sustainable. <laughs> that's true. That's true. But there are a lot of reasons, you know, why they're not good at the four quarter. And I'm not, okay. I'm not, you know, 
trying to defend them. I'm just trying to, I also had bigger expectations of them. But when you check facts, when you see their situation, the injury problems, the transition period, I mean. So you're not them. worried about them. Uh, because you're, my level of concern is free. So you, and your, less, how your level of concern is free, then you think they're not making the playoffs. Uh, no, I have concerns that they might not be as good as to be competitive for the Final Four in the series. They might lose the home court advantage for the playoffs, and then they might lose. Yeah, but might, you, said, mean, you said your goal for Olympia Cos is, is to, to make the playoffs. I you mean, expect I'm not worried. I mean, I'm, I'm worried that they are not going to make the Final Four. That's why my level of concern is free. But, uh, you know, mm. I, will, I think they were, they're making the playoffs for sure, but they're not, I don't think they're making the Final Four. I also because, think they're going to make the these playoffs. problems. Yeah, but so. if we're looking for the biggest goals, I'm not saying that Final Four should be something, you know, for granted for them. Still, I, I think it's like free. And you, you you have free as well? Yeah, I have free because uh, okay. just I, I think uh, the team and the fans expect a Final Four from them, not only I'll playoffs. Think they'll get better in this last part of the season. Players are getting back from, from the injuries. They're going to find the chemistry. They're going to figure it out mm -hmm. in the four quarters somehow, at least to some extent, where they will be better and where they will be winning more games in the four quarters. They're so. not bad now. It's no, just... no, no, no. Yeah. Mm. My concern level is only two. Maybe I'm being too nice to Olympiakos because, again, Panathinaikos fans are going at me for I don't know what reasons, actually. Olympiakos fans are after No, no, well? Panathinaikos. Ah, and yeah. now I'm being kind of nice to Olympiakos. So, ah, like, yeah. I, got, again, uh, man. I got messages on Instagram. One guy says, why do you hate Pao so much? It's not cool. And I respond, I don't know. Maybe something happened in my childhood or maybe it's just <laughs> destiny. <laughs> Then the other guy says, unfortunately for you, we are coming. I say, good for you, man. <laughs> and he says, no offense, Pause, keep up the man. good work in your channel. Okay. <laughs> yeah. like, nice. I, I think because you said... Um, like I said, I yeah. wouldn't prefer Panathinaikos to win the EuroLeague because they, are, uh, they, they built a new roster and I prefer teams with yeah. continuity. And I saw, I, I think mm. for this exact reason, because I saw a lot of comments that Oh hey, but every Euroleague winner uh, yeah, yeah. won by buying a lot of players for twenty-five plus million CSK. Yeah, uh, but it doesn't stop me from preferring teams that at least have the same core for let's say two or three seasons. Yeah, but you know. it's not helping the beef. I, as I said, maybe it's something that happened in childhood. <laughs> Was there any response? <laughs> Some, uh, for, for this no experience, not at no. all. No. Let's Maybe go. he was surprised as well, you know. <laughs> no. He didn't expect you to be so open. Maybe I was so just honest. traumatized by Di Diamantidis Batiste pick and roll and I just cannot come over it. Overcome it. Uh, actually, Partizan managed to overcome Get over the it. 24 <laughs> Sorry points. Sorry for my bad English. 24 points uh, deficits. And we actually witnessed one of the biggest comebacks in the yearly history since 2007 when this data was tracked in the year league. Because this comeback of a 24 point deficit against Maccabi is the fourth biggest comeback in the yearly history in the last 15 years. The legendary Asako Prokom pulled off the biggest yearly comeback in 2012 when they overcame a 28 point deficit, deficit versus Montepaschi. And Partizan, they were minus 24 in the middle of the second quarter, 13 to 37. Uh, and actually, this year they came back from a lot of bad situations. Like they were minus 15 against Milan, minus 14 against Fenerbahce, minus 11 against Vesda, minus 10 against Pau. And all those deficits were in the second half of the game. Uh, but once again, they, they, they showed their uh, character. And there was this interesting timeout actually in the second uh, quarter because Maccabi was playing, um, again, credit to Maccabi, they're, they're playing so great um, given the circumstances that they have to go through and they were just having another great game. But in the second quarter, there was this timeout when Partizan was behind by 19. There was EuroLeague TV where they were filming the timeout and there was this voice I didn't see the face because, you know, there were a lot of people uh, fronting the camera. And it was said that, let's go, let's uh, go, we're right here, we're down, but we're right there, keep fighting. And, you know, it's not easy to uh, to stay positive and hopeful when you're minus 19 playing in your home court and Maccabi had a tremendous start. 
But, you know, guys, and I think it was actually James Nunnally who had a tremendous game. Uh, again, he, he saw an opportunity. And I remember that there was this kind of emotional moment. Some other players also stepped in. And there was Jelko. Before this whole sequence, he was like, uh, you know, he was loud. He was he was angry in some situations. But then he just listened uh, to the speech. He made that uh, short poise, uh, waited his players to speak out. And uh, then he calmly, calmly continued the lead, dropping the play and, and et cetera. And they came back and basically in, in, in quarter and a half, they tied the game uh, soon. So... But that that was a hell of a comeback, and what were your main highlights of that comeback? Definitely, I don't know. Do we want to talk talk about how Maccabi got that huge advantage, or just about the comeback? Okay, let's start with the, that huge advantage. They started the game twenty no sixteen to zero. Sixteen to zero, I think there was like some crazy scores in 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 Belgrade twenty three to five, twenty seven to nine, thirty four, eleven, and just. Partizan basically started with absolutely no rhythm. Maccabi started s- to switching right from the first minute and they were just playing one-on-one. But Maccabi in the offense was just amazing to watch. And to me, the highlight probably was uh, not even from that huge run, but the last uh, possession of the second quarter uh, when they played this uh, pick and roll with a corner, corner exit to uh, Tamir Blad, I think. And uh, somebody from Partizan lost focus a bit off the ball on defense, like it happened for a lot of times in the first half. And But Maccabi didn't stop there. It was that Lorenzo passes to Tamir Blatt. Tamir Blatt fakes, goes inside, passes to Brown back. He, de- he, he don't shoot. He goes back in again and then kicks out to Tamir Blatt, who is wide open from free point. Like, there were nobody else from Partizan who could have recovered. And they... It was a beautiful set play with uh, unselfishness, complete unselfishness from Maccabi. And to me, their offense is, 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 is beautiful to watch. And, and this was one of the main highlights to me from that uh, first quarter. And then in the second half and already in the second quarter and the, and the second part of it, I think it was James Nunnally, simple as that. But also the um, Ognjen Yaramas and Uros Trifunovic. And they were in the best lineup. The, their best lineup, Partizan's best lineup, was with uh, Ognjen Yaramas, Nanali, Trifunovic, uh, Lide, and uh, Bruno Caboclo. These five guys. And they played the entire fourth quarter, uh, basically. Smilagic was the only guy who played two minutes in, in, in the place of Lide. Jelko didn't want to change a- any of those guys. And of course, Nanali was not there because he was ejected. In the fourth? Yeah. He was there in the third quarter, and they were the best lineup. And uh, to me, what uh, you know, these players who play less minutes usually on Partizan brought in was was energy. Yaramas was amazing defending Lorenzo Brown, I think, for the couple for a couple of times. Uh, Trifuno, which was going for offensive rebounds, there was that two double save. Uh, Smilagic saves the ball, falling this- out of bounds. Then the- Trifunovic. Uh, catches it also falling out of bounds and somehow it it falls to I think Yaramas and he makes a layup perfect pass perfect setup for the layup and I think it was the hustle play of the season that we had I mean definitely yes my luggage going into the corner running for the ball which looked dead you know and throwing it in the yeah. uh, on the top of the gym and yeah as I mentioned a lot of volleyball stuff uh, was involved. Uh, and it was amazing because they were lacking it to start the game. Maccabi were playing amazing offense, but I think what Partizan lacked is basic energy because, you know, they're not the best defensive team. Uh, they make mistakes. But if you don't have energy on top of that, you you have minus 24 deficit that, that you saw in a Stark Arena. But then uh, after 15 minutes, it all suddenly changed. And I think also the magic of uh, Stark Arena helped a lot because when you make these plays that we, we yeah. just talked about, the arena just went crazy and they they scored a lot in transition after after those good defensive sequences of Yaramas, of, of, of Nunnally. And then it was, you know, Maccabi just couldn't, couldn't stop the bleeding, uh, I would say that. And... Uh, then some uh, guys that didn't play in the four, third quarter, the main guys, Punter came back in, uh, PJ Dozier came back in, and we didn't mention PJ until now, but he was the top scorer I think in this game, and had some okay, and had a, a lot of uh, had a lot of points in the fourth quarter 
important points. But uh, I looked up the, the, the box score as well. James not only created or scored 20 points uh, in the third quarter. Oh, in the third quarter alone? Alone, yeah. Wow. And then he was thrown out, I think, in the first or second possession of the fourth quarter. While the game was still, I think, tied. And I was like, okay, who knows how it goes. But just Partizan just kept going. P.J. Dozier took over his role. And, and it was an amazing game. I mean, the atmosphere... I was I was kind of jealous, you know. I'm not I'm not I'm not seeing that, and uh, the the gym was rocking. And actually, I think we have to speak about James Nunnally more. I remember that I think it was Ritas who put him in his All Year League second team of the midseason, right? Yeah. Because I didn't watch the entire podcast, but I remember this this part specifically because I mean he's playing really I would say underrated season. Uh, uh, he's averaging 13.1 points per game, his third best in the yearly career. He's playing career high 28 minutes, career high in assists, free assists. He he gets a lot of uh, assignments from Jelko Bradovic from the playmaking standpoint, what we also saw mm. in, in that game. And as you mentioned in the third quarter, 3.6 rebounds, second best in his career. His efficiency machine in shooting, uh, 58% in two-point shooting ties his career best, 40 5.8 from free second best uh, and he holds the best offensive rating on his team with him on, on the court part Tizan outscores their opponents by 8.5 uh, points per 100 possessions and he's playing really really solid basketball and he saved partisans asses in a lot of games and in, in late uh, situations on, on crunch time so kudos to james i know that he thinks that we're worst but i mean he's yeah he's, he's playing one of his best years if not the best season combine the team success as well He's probably saying right now that we are dick riding, but oh sure, uh, <laughs> yeah. you have to give credit where credit is due. Yeah, and I love that he used the GIF uh, uh, on Twitter. That uh, classic GIF. Uh, they had us in the first half. I'm not gonna uh, lie. <laughs> I didn't yeah. see that because he has blocked me. So uh, that, well, shame on <laughs> you. Thanks for informing. I'm shame on you, man. So he's probably not going to see this sequence of the podcast, uh, but. Uh, great game that... by him everything went through him uh in the in the in the third quarter in the second quarter when you know partizan were slowly climbing back uh he was the guy that basically also helped them to to come back not only in the third quarter but also in the first half because to start the game partizan mm -hmm. couldn't couldn't defend but couldn't score also and they were playing a lot of one-on-one -on -one. And uh, with him, you know, getting into his rhythm early, it, it just helped immensely, I think, Partizan in this game. And definitely, a, let's say, a huge impact by Yaramas, Rifunovic, all those other guys, second unit guys. But, you know, everything went through James Nunnally in this game offensively. We just had a break in Jalgiris' game. I look at the score, I see 41-19, Maccabi's leading. And my colleague says... Well, Partizan is a very good second half team. They will be fine. I'm like, what are you talking about? They will be fine. They're, they're yeah. down by 22. At home. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, he was right. Uh, by the way, one fun fact about this crazy start by Maccabi. So they started the game 16 to 0, and it's actually the best uh, EuroLeague start by the away team ever since 2007. The best actual start from 2007 uh, belongs to Panathinaikos. Uh, Panathinaikos in 2018 EuroLeague playoffs, game one of the series against Real Madrid, they started the game 20 to zero, and it was this legendary Panathinaikos team with Nick Kalatis, Mike James, Tanasi Antetokounmpo, Chris Singleton, and James Gist in their starting yeah, lineup. Tanasi Antetokounmpo, let's. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> There's the starting lineup. I've just mentioned the starting lineup of the <laughs> did, team that did, had this start. Sorry, but did I hear you correctly? He said legendary team. Uh, no. Did you, did he say that? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> legendary team with the last. <laughs> yep. You see, you just you just. How can Pau fans love you? <laughs> wow. So much disrespect on the podcast, man. What it's are you crazy, talking man. about? Disrespect, man. man. Tanasis under the Kumpo is the best paid cheerleader in the NBA, and everybody knows that. And it's not like he had any big, significant impact in, in EuroLeague. I mean, come on, guys. Let's let's be <laughs> Legend let's be real, man. <laughs> I thought we were getting some love in this podcast. You know, we did some stuff for Panthnikos, but man, there's no chance that we will get their appreciations. 
Anyways, just the, the last fun fact about Maccabi uh, and their start. Uh, we had four signings last week. Uh, these weren't marquee names on the market, but teams did some moves. Uh, for instance, the latest signing was Javonte Smart uh, signed by Zvezda. Uh, there was also Deshaun Thomas coming to Asphalt Villarban, Martin Hermanson transferring to Alba Berlin, and Milan made uh, signed Rodney McGruder. Anything that st- stands out to you? Uh, do you have any any thoughts, any ideas if they're going to change the trajectory of their season? For instance, is Javonte Smart something that Zvezda was missing to make it to the play-in? Is McGruder going to change anything in Milan? Um, well, since Zvezda let Shabazz Napier go and uh, they brought in Topic and Topic got injured, they probably needed a guard. They needed Nedovic a, they needed a body. Nedovic is yeah. out as well. Teo had some problem, slight problem yeah. during the last game. But you know, as it is, usually it's it's very hard to say what can Javante Smart bring to the team because we're talking about these borderline NBA players. Sometimes you find a gem, sometimes you find a player that maybe just cannot adjust to, to EuroLeague basketball. Uh, you never know. He's 24 years old. He's still a young player. Uh, it's it's going to be his first experience in Europe. He played G League. He played in Philadelphia and Miami and Milwaukee. So it's just impossible to say that he's making Zvezda a better team or, or, or is he going to be a bust? Nobody knows. But I think uh, Milano... I mean, are we really going to talk about Alba and Asfel making moves? They're just competing for the last spot, I uh. think, in the year league. But uh, uh, Milano and Zvezda kind of make interesting moves, but they're really different, I think. Uh, Magruder is a veteran who is, a, you know, really good if paired with uh, the right players around him. He's not going to be as scoring-oriented as uh, Javante Smart is going to be in Zvezda. And I liked well, one description that I found actually about Magruder on the internet uh, while looking for his games. Small forward game, but in the point guard size. And he's he's playing like this, you know. He's not a fancy guy who's making shots off the dribble, step backs. Uh, his size and his skill set uh, while scoring is probably the reason he didn't get more playing time in the NBA. Uh, he has an average wingspan, but I think... In Milano, next to Shabazz, he can really help uh, in the perimeter because he's a solid defensive player. Uh, he can score, you know, when attacking in the closeout. He loves uh, that that floater shot, and um, I think he's a smart player. He know he he will accept his role. So, and and on the other hand, with Javante Smart, it, it's a lottery. But uh, I like I like his potential. He can really knock down shots uh, after the dribble. Uh, streaky shooter, uh, recently had 10 free-pointers in the game in the G, in the G League. The defense were kind of non-existent, but, you know, he can knock down shots. He can create space for himself. Um, he's a typical modern player. Uh, it's either a free-pointer or a layup for him most of, the, most of the time. So it's going to be interesting, as Rita said, how he's going to deal mm-hmm. with... Uh, paint the, the the help side defense in the paint how he's going to make the decisions but uh definitely Zvezda needed uh, someone and uh I think I think he can have some good games for Zvezda if Sfiropoulos gives him some confidence he finds rhythm early I think he can be a, a help for Zvezda mm. I don't know about what you guys think uh, I said Donatus. I I said my part about smart um, what do you think about Rodney M- Magruder? Magruder well he he has a lot more experience. He's 32 years old, but again, his experience with European basketball is one season in Hungary. That's so. Uh, T- uh, ten or fact, at ten Amo, right? Yeah, yeah. or That's 11 years first, ago. His first pro. Yeah, season his first was pro in Hungary, season because he was he, went to the NBA. he was undrafted. Uh, he spent four years in Kansas State, and, and and then he started his career in in, in Hungary. And eventually got his chances going through the G League and and signing a contract in Miami, so it's 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 tough to say again. Even though he has experience, uh, he doesn't have Euroleague experience. But okay, uh, you're going into a veteran team like Milan uh, that's dealing with some injuries right now, and they needed some reinforcement. It's not like they they're gonna expect you to be the star of the show. So he plays his role the right way. If he plays mm. defense, I think he'll be, he'll be fine. 
the same, I mean, with Javante Smart. Who knows? He might turn out to be a, a good scorer for Zvezda. But since they have Milos, they have Iago Dos Santos, you don't expect him to just all of a sudden become the primary ball handler that Zvezda will yeah. depend on to win games. So, uh, but, but it's, it's, it's nice to see uh, some new additions, some new faces mm. in the league. I think uh, more will be asked from Javante oh, yeah, to that's do true. In, in Zvezda than, than from Magruder in Milano, you know, so. And yeah, going to be because Magruder is going to play off ball probably mm. most of the time. And, and he might actually fit this role well. You mentioned that he's not going to be the, he, he's not going to be needed as an alpha man on the team. And although he doesn't have big European experience, he's known for the IQ. I talked uh, to some uh, scouts and they said that, for instance, in Magruder's case, he's a true pro that is always ready to play, a huge competitor on both sides. He can do a, a little bit of everything. There's all the little things to help his team. Big IQ to compensate his physicality in defense, uh, reliable catch and shoot uh, threat. So, you know, it. Sounds like a perfect role player for Milan. Sounds nice. Sounds like a perfect role player for any team. Yeah. Uh, and regarding Javonte Smart, uh, he might fit Zvezda with his combination of size, athleticism, and talent. Uh, one scout told me that he's not maybe this long-range shot creator. Uh, he prefers slashing uh, and beat uh, the switch defense one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, and... Also, his physicality and his size makes him a little bit underrated defender, uh, and he should be a nice great, fit to Zvezda. Uh, too. Great wingspan. He's yeah. like plus nine, ten centimeters on his height. So, and he's kind of tall for 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 a guard spot. So. Yeah. I also talked with some other guy from from the Euroleague, and he said that you know this is a very interesting signing. I mean, this Javante Smart to Zvezda, and and me too. I think that uh, it's always I, I'm always a fan of those. Uh, how we call it, you know, uh, never mind. I'm a fan of those mid-season moves when you sign somebody who is unknown in the market, somebody from the G League or the NBA environment rather than going for washed player in the Europe uh, that is just a free agent right now and you clearly know the ceiling of his player. Of course, it goes according to team needs. It depends on what you actually need. But in Zvezda's case, I really support this idea of signing somebody from uh, from from the G League, from the NBA environment, something which is fresh and new and, and at the European stage. You support them until they play good, if they play good. <laughs> uh, I always support risky the moves. The, so. the patience is, uh, you know, there's no patience. Fades, in, fades in, away in Zvezda, quick. That's, fades away that's quick. one. We cleared it out in the first segment of our podcast with <laughs> the head coaches list. Uh, regarding the Sean Thomas and Martin Hermanson, I mean. I love Deshaun Thomas as a player. I love his stint in Bayern. I've actually flew back to Vilnius and I met him in the airport of Barcelona. He was already going from Badalona to, to Asphalt. That's one fact from me about Deshaun Thomas. The other one about Martin Hermanson. I heard that if Potseco has stayed in Villarban, there was a high chance that Hermanson was about to join Asphalt. Uh, hmm. And now he's going to Alba. I actually love Hermanson as a playmaker. I thought that he might have deserved a chance to play for a bigger competitor. Maybe Partizan, uh, who knows, he can also offer size, you know, playmaking abilities. But maybe in this situation when he's coming off injuries and a situation where he was not getting much playing time, in Alba he will get those minutes and he will get his confidence back. Yeah, I haven't seen him play for such a long time. True, true. Uh, and just for the last part of our podcast, we have some NBA Europe related topics. And we mentioned quite quickly in the last Q&A podcast about this NBA Paris game, which didn't get a lot of attention here in Europe. I mean, nobody was talking about that game. There was no reason to talk about that game. Uh, so I thought, who should come to Europe? Who would come to Europe that you would pay your flight tickets, accommodation, and also game tickets, which are usually, they cost pretty, a lot, I would say. Uh, you, might, you may pay a few hundred euros uh, to watch that game to NBA uh, teams competing against each other. Mm. So where do you think, which teams should play and which gym and which uh, country that you would actually mm. go for that trip? 
I remember even our colleague uh, said that there aren't a lot of tickets for that game because NBA usually just gives out. Yeah, uh, it's similar to, to the all these tickets yeah. go to sponsor. It's or even, similar or to the All Star game. Mm. True, true. Uh, on public sale, there are not too many tickets available. Um, I don't know if it's just a regular season game. Well, and if you can guarantee that everyone's gonna be playing, I want to see the Boston Celtics. For example, facing uh, someone from the Western Conference uh, could be the Denver Nuggets, could be the Lakers because of the hype and the so-called rivalry between yeah. Boston and LA. Good luck uh, uh, getting ESPN or TNT or ABC to uh, agree that the Boston LA yeah, is happening no, it's, in Europe. I know but, it is impossible. Yeah, but that, we are talking about hypothetical. I'm situation. just saying, yeah, like it's it, it, if it's a regular season mm. he, game, I want it to mm. have some some meaning like not just uh the brooklyn nets playing the cleveland cavaliers mm. and i want to see great players and good teams so boston celtics definitely uh one of those um we could be talking about Embiid facing Jokic, sixers playing the nuggets uh i would be worried I, if if sixers are coming i'm not sure i'm buying i'm buying the tickets because, because you never know so if that's why playing. i'm saying if I'm completely sure that the star players will be mm. there and they will perform. To, so to me, it's simple. To be honest, uh, Nuggets against Dallas in in Belgrade. There is Nikola Jokic, the icon of Serbian basketball, and there is Luka Doncic, the hard Zvezda fan. Right. And you're bringing them to this. You know, it it's not going to be the same like in Partizan or Zvezda games, but still they're gonna make them some noise and. To bring those guys like Luca, I mean, he's he's from Europe to play in this gym would be special for him, and I I believe that we would see a competitive game, and mm -hmm. it would be a great great experience. So, I mean, Jokic is a kind of a no brainer. I thought about another uh, about a matchup, and I think that Luca Doncic ticks all the boxes in this case. I would also like to see Minnesota, for example, as they they're a pretty exciting team right now, and Anthony Edwards is one of the most mm. exciting young younger stars in the league right now. I know he's American, he doesn't have any European ties or anything like that. But um, well, from the European side, you have Gobert. Uh, Belgrade, I'm not too keen on going to Belgrade. I would probably prefer a destination like Barcelona, Madrid. Athens, or... you put Yanis with Milwaukee yeah. again against Luka Doncic because he understands the meaning of playing here in Europe and yeah, he will do you his could, best. You could go with Athens, but. NBA game gives you NBA atmosphere, so it doesn't matter that much whether it's Belgrade or it's Athens. It, 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 it's going to be different. I'm just thinking where I want to go as a as a human being. Okay. <laughs> so Spain, I always love to go to Spain. Somewhere where it's sunny in January. Yeah. I don't know. For me, it's uh, quite a few teams that I have on my list, but I think Minnesota was a great choice as well. Anthony Edwards, definitely, but he has to be playing against some uh, another great team, you know. Uh, I would love to see Steph Curry still, even at this point of his career. I would pay money to go to go see him in Europe. Denver, obviously. Bucks with Dame and Giannis. Uh, Boston, for sure. Blazers, but just because they're my favorite team from, uh, from childhood. I would I would think OKC is a name mm. is a fun team to watch at the moment. They're building something special there with with SGA, with uh, Chet, with Jalen Williams, with uh, Josh Giddy, and they have so many interesting young guys. Dallas, Phoenix with their superstar power, just to get a chance to to see KD play in Europe, that would be I think cool. And uh, if you have these teams matched up against each other, I would I. Would, I I would probably go go and see them. It doesn't really matter where in Europe. Mm. It, yeah, there when the when the NBA choose uh, the game uh, in Europe. First of all, it's it's a kind of complicated process because usually they decide a few years in advance. So you're not guaranteed what you're getting if the team will do some trades and stuff. You're not sure how the team is going to change. But there are also some other main factors that I figured it out. Uh, for instance, a lot of uh, is based on the strength of the, of the TV contract in Europe. And for instance, Paris has the second biggest TV contract uh, in Europe behind Spain. Um, also, since 
a lot of tickets uh, shared and distributed among sponsors and a lot of guests. It's also kind of a European hub where sponsors would like to come. So you have to find a sweet place for them. So it's London or Paris? London and Paris takes a lot of boxes uh, boxes yeah. in, in, in those cases. So these are preferred destinations for the NBA. And I'm not sure if Adam Silver has communicated it yet or maybe any, anybody else from the NBA re reporters reported it as well. But I heard that there's high chance although the nba is happy with having just one game uh, throughout the season in europe they might do two games where same teams would play they would play two games uh, consecutive games in in europe and hearing it might be paris again and although again it's always more likely to have Eastern Conference team playing in Europe because it's East Coast, time difference and stuff. It's easier to manage it uh, and to find this balance between NBA uh, and Europe. I heard that this time it's very likely that Vembanyama might come and would make a perfect sense. I mean, in Paris, I'm, I was always mm -hmm. liking of those French superstar players, players like even Rudy Gobert. I'm not sure if he ever came to play in Europe this NBA game. So... For me, it would make a lot of sense. And of course, if Vembanyama is coming with San Antonio, of course, it depends on who are playing against, but it should be a nice, nice, nice game to watch. For so Europeans. Minnesota versus San Antonio confirmed Paris 25, Paris 2025 game. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But again, I, I think that <clears throat> uh, since there's no not a lot of interest in this game, both in Europe and the NBA, I would try, I would risk if I'm at the NBA, I would risk to do some something different, like they did with the All Star. So just put this game in Belgrade, bring Jokic, bring no uh, Luka, do that. try to create some highlights. Uh, no. NBA doesn't see a lot of potential. I mean, a lot of benefits of having those games uh, here in Europe because they think it's it's way easier to make the game popular through the highlights and a lot of stuff. So there's no need to invest in those games. But still, you will create some highlights from having games in, in regions like Serbia, Belgrade, and Athens, uh, Greece, bringing those local heroes uh, to the country. And, you know, uh, at least they're going to create some e experience and atmosphere. Because I talked to guys in, who went to the game in Paris, and they said it was horrible. You know, But I, I don't think uh, having a game in Belgrade, Jokic Luka, would be great. But I don't think the atmosphere would be nice. Like we mentioned, yeah. almost more than half the tickets are given out to by the NBA. So it's not going to be people that mm. are coming to games in Belgrade. And, uh, you know, even in the Serbian national team watching them in Belgrade, you don't have the same atmosphere as True. in the Zvezda or Partizan game. It's completely different. You don't have the uh, organized chance and, and, mm. all, and stuff like that. So... You but know, at least you're gonna uh, give them some reasons to support somebody. Hey, no. but we can s sweet talk Serbian uh, basketball no, fans no, as no, much no. as much as we want. But uh, you said it yourself. It's like a hub for for uh, NBA people, for the sponsors, for, for for everybody to meet in Europe. So Belgrade is definitely not a destination where they're going. Like Paris and London, these are the prime examples. Madrid could be the next one. I don't think even if we have that game in Belgrade, the atmosphere is 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 it's NBA, It's going to be NBA atmosphere, and in, in any city. You play yeah, if you play an NBA game, you get NBA atmosphere. Plus, with it's just easy. you know thirty percent of the tickets being on sale for 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 the people, so it's going to be chill atmosphere. I think. Uh, Mike Brown uh, had no chill after last night's uh, loss, and especially in the press conference. He made it a laptop conference, bringing the laptop uh, to the press conference to show the reasons why he was so mad that followed with his uh, ejection uh, in the game. He actually brought it to this game because it did it first in the Turkish league last year, it was in the semifinal series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, It was a great video. Uh, and actually, our social media team brought a good topic on on Twitter and Instagram. Which yearly coach will most likely bring a laptop into the press conference like Mike <laughs> Brown did? And of course, if we would exclude the this because he's now an inactive coach. So could you list your top three front runners, front runners to bring the laptop hmm. to the press conference? Well, first of all, I have to say that Mike Brown not only did bring a laptop, but uh, he was actually... Very explaining. specific, explaining all the details, and it was so great to to hear that and see that. And 
I wouldn't say he 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 had zero chill. I've, he se- seemed pretty calm. Like the game has happened already. They lost the heartbreaking loss, but in the press conference, he looked like he's controlling his emotions. He said he respects the referees and his and their job, and he just showed those examples and he. Uh, said why why he's frustrated because there was no consistency and, and he actually had great points very good points and I, I loved hearing that watching that and the laptop is is like um, it's just a way for you to show not only to tell but also to show like, like um, so who who could do that in in Europe and uh, actually on top of that I actually think that it's the way to elevate the press conference game to the next level to be honest because those press conferences they're really boring yeah. you know it's it's the same things are being repeated yeah. and it's not enjoyable experience both for media and for coaches so let's elevate to the next level bring the laptop or <laughs> put some place on the screen explain them break them down and it's way more engaging it's way more entertaining and it's educating so the, the problem is that situation most of the time you would get uh, a head coach uh explaining why he is furious about a, a, a call okay you wouldn't probably have we too many co- roles. you wouldn't have too many coaches let's say yeah. explaining we could make some their clip selection no no officials no 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 calls just game yes. game situations i i don't think that coach has a lot of interest to explain in his uh, offensive sets to to media people in the press conference, but or, if, or point out mistakes by an offensive individual players, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. They you could know. break down some at least clutch Jel- plays Jel- of Jel- the game. Jelko shouting at Smilagic, "Why are you staying there? Not twenty centimeters to the right, you know." Yeah. Oh my god, that is true. But you know, I. I could see some of the coaches in your league doing something like that with the laptop saying like, look, this wasn't a sportsmanlike foul and this 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 was like, explain to me why is there no consistency. I could see Andrea Trinkieri showing up with the laptop. He is um, definitely capable of... of yeah, um, I, yeah. I, I could see that happening. Um, he is actually the front runner according to our Instagram followers. He got most likes yeah. in this discussion. Uh, I could see Ataman, but probably not with a laptop. He's going to just take his phone. He's going to show it on his phone. <laughs> uh, oh, Ataman also got a lot of points. Yeah, he was in the top four. The third coach to rank. I would have voted Pacheco, but yeah, he's yeah, out. Yeah. yeah, that's also... <laughs> Pacheco, if he still definitely, was the coach, definitely. that's quote unquote by one Instagram user. Mm, from there the, were, there from were the some rest. votes for Bartzokas, actually. I think uh, Luca Banki has a lot of like charisma and passion, and it's something with these Italian coaches, you know, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. Anyway, guys, I saw I uh, found this on Twitter. Uh, this is the what actually Mike Brown was showing to the okay. to the media. It's just uh, Dame time, you know, happened. Okay. And that was he's actually showing it. It wasn't no refer- referee calls, you know. <laughs> That's a meme material. We for have sure. Patrick Beverly with uh, showing. Do you remember that time when Pat Beverly went to the photographer? Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he, he was, was showing, showing the camera fo- fo- to the ref. He was showing the camera. He was showing the photos to the ref. Like, look, it's a foul. It's a foul. <laughs> that would be exciting Incredible. to see happening during a, a game. But was it a foul on LeBron? I think it was Me. something. It was something yeah, like it was that. On LeBron. Me at 10.30 every night trying to convince my girlfriend to get Taco Bell. (laughs) 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 Uh, That's a nice one. That's a meme material. Taco Bell is overrated, by the way. Sorry. Oh, that's on both. Take that for data. And just the last question where I wanted to hear your opinion, rant, potentially. uh, What do you think about Carmelo Anthony bringing up this (laughs) controversy that... (laughs) This whole idea of Nikola Jokic, number 15, and uh, everything just to erase the legacy of Carmelo Anthony in, in, in Denver. Aritis, <laughs> the floor is all yours. No, it's, Go. There is not much to be said. Like The, no. the man didn't do no. his research before stating something. I mean, it, it seems like he does not associate himself with the Denver Nuggets because you see him as sort of a New York Knicks ambassador in Madison Square Garden and you don't really see him in Denver. But talking about this number 15, uh, let's not forget that Denver Nuggets drafted Nikola Jokic at 41 in second round. 
So it's not like they were drafting Wembanyama with all the hype that he's <laughs> going to be the best player in basketball history. It was just a second round pick. And the man played with number 15 in Mega Basket. So if 15 was available at the time in Denver, well, he chose 15. Or maybe the club gave him 15. Uh, I don't think anybody was making any fuss about it at the time when he, he played his rookie season and people saw him with, with number 15. Like, uh, Unless the Denver Nuggets have... S- they are so genius that they knew Nikola Jokic is the possible goat. I think they knew. There's a reason they why knew it. Nikola, five-year-old Nikola yeah. is wearing this. So, so they knew hoodie. it, and then they said, like, well, nobody knows now, but in our lab here underground, we know that he's going to be the best center of all time. So let's give him 15, and people will forget about Carmelo. Because let's check facts. <laughs> Carmelo was traded in 2011. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Nikola Jokic plays his first game in Mega in 2012. And he starts wearing this number 15. Yeah, That's so they knew it all suspicious. along. Like, it, I think they were scouting him since he was two years old. And they knew that he's going to be number 15. Uh, so, <laughs> to, to me, it's funny because yeah. you know how uh, the numbers before in Europe, uh, where you could choose only from number four to number 15 if you are playing. And especially in, in youth, there is no number selection. In, there were no number selection here in Europe because... If you are a big guy, you are from 10 to 15, and probably the tallest guy, and the chubby, if you are a chubby guy like Jokic was before, you, you get the number 15 because it's the biggest jersey that, that exists in the team. So that's probably why he's wearing number 15. He definitely doesn't, I, I don't think he cares about his jersey number. He doesn't care. So, <laughs> so you know, it's just, it, it's a funny story from Carmelo. Maybe I actually, I would like to hear Jokic's reaction. But maybe there would be it, no look, reaction. I mean, I, exactly, exactly. He he would be like. I didn't guys. listen to the full podcast. Actually, maybe we're taking things out of context. Maybe Carmelo was joking. Who knows? I watched this short clip, and he didn't look like somebody who was joking. <laughs> and that's the weird part for me. We we both calculated last week. He made like what almost three hundred millions in his career. He had only, a great only basketball from, career. From, only from from his NBA contracts, contracts. NBA contract. Yeah. You He's a three-time Olympic life. champion, yeah, uh, a legendary scorer, a, a player who definitely left his mark in, in the league. He's one of those 75 legends that the NBA introduced uh, last year. And like, you bother yourself with such why, such thing. Why would any of this matter to you? And he's actually a great guy. He was in this FIBA World Cup as one of the ambassadors. I remember there was media opportunity. And he, he had some nice thoughts about international basketball, about Team USA and stuff. So I was a bit surprised to see him, you know, spitting this controversy. I just... It's however, just sad, man. It's just sad. However, should should the Denver Nuggets have retired his jersey? I, th- I think yes. Maybe yes. Maybe. I think yes. And I think this is why he is uh, a little bit pissed about it. Yeah. It's not because Jokic is wearing that number right now, because I think he thinks he deserves to, to have his number retired. Okay, that, that is fair. I, I can buy into it because, because like, um, he, he was from the same draft class with LeBron James. He was compared to LeBron James uh from the big, very beginning, from his rookie season, he was great. He, you could already see he's mm-hmm. going to be one of the best scorers in, in the league. Uh, he brought uh, the Denver Nuggets back on the NBA landscape, the playoffs. Uh, they became competitive. They were building around him. Uh, they went to the Western Conference Finals. It's just that at the time you had Powell and Kobe, and, well, it was pretty obvious mm. that no one – is going to win the East as long as these guys are there. So uh, the, West, the West, sorry. So, uh, yeah, he didn't win the title. Uh, he had a team with Allen Iverson, Chauncey Billups, J.R. Smith, and so many characters later on. But uh, I do agree that, well, he's one of the iconic players in the Denver Nuggets history. Hmm. And look, uh, s- s- until last year, they were one of the 11 remaining teams that never won the NBA title. And they didn't even play in the finals. So, uh, I mean, it's not like Carmelo did not deliver or anything like that. So he definitely deserves more respect from the Denver Nuggets side, from the fan base and everybody else. But just that statement about number 15 was ridiculous. And there's actually a great tweet by coach George Carly himself 
Uh, he tweeted, Mela saved pro hoops in Denver and he shouldn't have demanded a trade, but the Nuggets can be petty. And, and multiple number 15s can hang in the Denver Raptors. Happens all the time. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. He's Why right. Not? Why not? Okay. I think we have one last thing. Oof. We do? He, he did some homework. Mantas. They made a good that team was... with Mantas. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't know. Mantas made this wow, during that, the podcast. That's a quick one. Wow. Yeah. You looked really weird, as I told you. I right? look bad. Uh, like I said, I look bad without a hat. Uh, it's not like <laughs> I look better with it, but I definitely look better with the front. How do you do, fellow kids? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm old. Dushkistas.com. That was probably... That's what this podcast was all about. Thank you all Me for watching. Me being old and, okay. <laughs> and looking bad. Not being serious. Oh, yeah. If you like us being serious and sometimes not too serious, follow us on basketnews.com and support us on basketnews.com slash plus to become our subscribers. See you soon.